welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 141 for Monday, May 17th, 2021. My name is Johnny, but the internet knows me as the birthday boy, and joining me as always is my good friend Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you, and yes, happy birthday to Minecraft, as we will get into in the news a little bit later. Um, if you are interested in hearing what I did for my birthday, which was, I mean, today, but we, we celebrated it on stream a couple of days ago with a food stream, my first ever food stream. We talked all about that in The Render Distance, which is an extended version of the podcast that you can get. If you're a patron of the show, uh, visit patreon.com slash the spawn chunks to find out how you can support the show and get in on all of the extra recorded action. So what have you been up to in Minecraft over the last week? The last week has been fairly quiet for me on the YouTube front because I am working really hard behind the scenes on the museum. Because of the inevitability of the next update, uh, and, and I, I've noticed a few other creators basically kind of putting their 116 series on hold or, you know, wrapping up what they're doing in 116 in preparation for the updates, so... I feel like the writing's on the wall and I need to really get moving on some of this. So I've paused work on the exhibits themselves and I'm now decorating the main entrance and corridors for episode 360 of the Survival Guide, which was going to be this 360 degree tour. I figured I may as well make it look a bit more presentable if I'm going to do a tour video at all. So I'm kind of working on some of that stuff. But aside from that, I still need to kind of figure out the outer boundaries of this and where I'm going to put a few other things. The next thing I have in mind really is the mob exhibit. So we're going to be capturing a bunch of skeletons and spiders and zombies and probably zombifying a few different villages. So we have some examples of those, getting an enderman in a boat somewhere, <laughs> that kind of thing. And I'm going to try and pull in as many mobs as I can uh, into the mob exhibit, which is probably going to largely be underground. So I don't have to worry about zombies catching fire in the sun and that kind of thing getting phantoms is probably going to be the hardest part of that whole deal but uh, we'll oh, see wow. how it all goes and then yeah i'm i'm just going to put together a, a mob exhibit and continue working towards getting all of the blocks getting a custom village built and that kind of thing but i am i'm at this point thinking about how this project is going to wrap up what i'm going to be able to do before the update arrives and what i'm going to do if the update arrives sooner than i expect uh, so I'm thinking we probably have like at least two, maybe three weeks before I really need to start worrying about ending this season of Survival Guide. But what can I do in the meantime is the question constantly on my mind at this stage. So if it gets a little bit quiet from me this week, that is probably because my head is down and I am hard at work on the museum. So out of curiosity, and, and I guess to refresh my mind and, and the minds of our, our listeners, uh, are you planning on starting a new survival guide right away? Or are you going to have like an interim and waiting, you know, for the, the full caves and cliffs later on this year? I figured it probably wasn't worth starting a new survival guide until new caves, because right. I didn't want people to have to tune into episode 50 of survival guide season two to watch a caving episode that should have been basically like the first thing you do in a new world. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I figured it was probably best to, once they split the update, I was going to stall Survival Guide until uh, part two of Caves and Cliffs and new generation. Uh, you know, starting a new world then seemed like the most convenient thing to do because I'm still not sure what's going to be the, the, the bridge between 117 and 118 worlds, if they're just going to fill the whole thing up with bedrock below zero in chunks you've already loaded and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. I have a couple of plans for interim series. I'm probably going to start either like a hardcore world or maybe just a kind of temporary uh, 117 like intermediate survival guide like if the survival guide is really for beginners then i'm going to make a mini series that assumes you know a little bit about minecraft already and maybe kind of gives you some tips and shortcuts for getting started in a world a little bit faster and maybe jumps ahead to making a mob farm in one of the earlier episodes so we can have bone meal from the beginning and do a ton of automatic farms right away instead of you know trying to locate a skeleton spawner and working our way up through that kind of hierarchy and mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how that goes. I've also been talking to a couple of people behind the scenes about other series and stuff I might do. Uh, there's still other competitions and stuff like Clash of the Creators are going to be going on. So I've got plenty of stuff, I think, to uh, keep myself occupied before I really start season two of Survival Guide. Nice. I've been thinking about this a lot, too, because of the snapshot playthroughs that I've been doing and... Uh, I will, I mean, I can report back and let you know because I mean, the Citadel is not going to be reset. We're going to 
roll forward and uh, trim chunks and and see what we can see and and use in the 117 part one this summer. Or sorry, I shouldn't say 117. In the 117, the Caves and Cliffs update part one this summer. Um, Because I don't want to wait for things like, you know, Deep Slate and um, other blocks like Copper and, and, and whatnot. And uh, there will be a time later on when we update to the Caves and Cliffs Part 2 where we'll have to figure out, like, how we're going to address those, that change, whether, you know, how much work has been done on the side of Mojang to make sure that, you know, there's a se- as much of a seamless transition as can be possible between yeah. the geometry of the new update versus the, the current cave system and stuff. So, um, but yeah, it just it's it's one of those things where... I do find the more that we learn about the updates, the more uncertainty and the more questions I have about like, how are they really going to do this? You know? and, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not, and I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm just like, there, there's all people that are much smarter than me working on this. And, and I'm very curious to see how it's going to, how it's going to pan out. And in the trickle down effect, like how, creators like yourself uh the the folks that i follow on hermitcraft and some of the other people that i follow on twitch and uh uh, my friend senos my online buddy senos that i I rate a lot like he's got these huge term plans and big worlds and like massive massive undertakings and so these kind of changes really affect how he's planning and how he can like and what he's going to do in the next like year yeah uh, as far as content creation goes and it's it's interesting to watch things like you mentioned earlier uh, just a few minutes ago about like you know certain creators wrapping up on on you know their current worlds uh in preparation for you know what's coming with the caves and cliffs part one and uh i'm curious to see what other creators are also going to do like how their plan is going to to hatch out i know what mine is and thankfully i don't have a lot of decisions to make i'm just it's steady on (laughs) and deal with and deal with it as it comes but you know if i was in a position where starting over or you know those kind of options were were something that i would have to consider like i don't know what i would do yeah, I think it's one of the problems of having all your eggs in one basket when it comes to yeah. either servers mm-hmm. or worlds or anything like that. Like if you are somebody who plays on a variety of different worlds and you've just kind of got a, co- a couple of casual servers going on the side, it's not going to trouble you too much. Whereas if you are somebody like, say, Fix It with Realm of Vastern or you with the Citadel or, you know, folks like Hermitcraft or any of the other kind of longer term servers out there, they've always got to time resets and make those decisions around when the updates are released And a lot of the time we don't know the exact dates of that until very close to the mark and when we start seeing release candidates for the updates. So yeah, it's Mm. it's an odd time, but I think everyone's going to adapt reasonably well as they can. And there's a lot of people, you know, branching out into modded and various other bits and pieces while they are trying to find stuff to do in the interim. Um, How is your snapshot playthrough going, by the way? Because I've seen you've been streaming a bit more of that this week. Yeah, I wanted to get ahead of it this week. I actually started streaming the snapshot. I did like a bonus stream on Monday uh, just because I wanted to not have a lot of grindy stuff to do uh, on Wednesday when the snapshot came out. Of course, not knowing that the snapshot was going to have the changes that it did. I was just like, I don't want to have to still be looking for a way to feed myself or, you know, um, be looking for diamonds and whatnot. So I was doing a little bit of just mining and, and other things. And over the course of the week, because I think I hit the snapshot stream twice or three times um, in shorter streams during the week, we were able to do a second version of the Dripstone farm, which has a whopping, are you ready for it? Uh, six to seven dripstone an hour. Um, <laughs> that's 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 technical marvel right there, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and that is from sixteen nodes across the top with water above it. So that is a dripstone block and a dripstone uh, stone piece underneath the block. Because I have not been able to get dripstone to form on its own. Uh, it will grow if there's already a stalactite that you put there manually but if there's not i've not been able to get one to form on its own Mm -hmm. uh maybe they just take longer i don't know um but i've 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 definitely had a stream that went like three hours and nothing happened and the whole place was loaded the whole time it's not like we were going into the nether or doing anything like that um and so uh having that come in is great i'm not building with it a lot so the fact that i've you know after a few hours in stream i've got 20 or 24 dripstone in the chest and i was relieved to uh, remember that it is a two by two grid of dripstone to give you a dripstone block not a nine by nine yeah so uh-huh. it was a lot easier to expand the farm uh than i thought uh, i'm using observers so it's not a cheap farm uh it's observers and pistons 
And so uh, without any sticky blocks, I have to use um, I have to use the one observer that then fires all of the pistons along the row, mm-hmm. uh, which may, in my experience, uh, limit the growth of the stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, so you'd be better off if you had like individual circuits, but I just wasn't there yet as far as the design goes. Um, but I mean, so far so good. It's passive. Like I don't have to do anything. It just, I just check the chest once in a while. Do you have uh, any, uh, designs for what you're going to do with the dripstone afterwards? Is it going to be a decorative thing? Are you looking to maybe use it for mob farms or what's, what's your feeling on what you're going to do with the dripstone you're farming? So I built this giant mob farm to help get myself back up to level 30 for enchants because I keep on dying. And uh, I was thinking I could use the dripstone as like a killing mechanism. You know, you drop the mobs onto it. Uh, I was thinking about um, potentially using any of the new blocks with with 117 as decorative. But I have not been able to gather a, a lot of the dripstone to even experiment with it. I'm only just now getting enough that I can say, okay, well, I can maybe make a nine by nine or a or a twelve by you know twelve patch of this and then figure out how to use it. Um, it does look good in the desert, like it has that kind of earthy you know, sandy look to it. So I, I'm sure there's places where I could probably use it in the desert. Uh, so I, I'm, I do want to try and build with these blocks. Um, that's another reason why, you know, after we unlocked Silk Touch with uh, finally a decent enchant, uh, I was able to get some beehives and get some bees going because now I can build with and wax copper and use it in the way that I want rather than just waiting for it to go to 100% oxidation yes. and, and turquoise. Right? I keep I keep forgetting that a bee farm is basically a prerequisite for working with copper at this stage. Yeah. And that's that's just something that always slips my mind. And then I realize, oh, yeah, if I want to build with this and have it stay that way, I need to have honeycomb. That's yep. yeah something something I'll need to be more aware of when I actually start playing in 117 for real. Yeah, and uh, we got lucky. We went exploring. We found a goat. We found a screaming goat, which promptly um, headbutted me off the, <laughs> you know, the mountain. I mean, I didn't. I fell a block. Like it wasn't like a big deal. But sure. Yeah. It was hilarious. Like to to experience that in real time in uh, and seeing like, all right, here's some goats. I wonder if we're gonna get one to headbutt us. And like the second goat we looked at went. Rah! Oh, good. And came right at us. It was I'm, it was really funny. I'm so glad that that happened, and it was like a fun experience because I I can imagine the goats feeling a little bit underwhelming to some people, but if you're mm-hmm. having fun with it on stream and you've got an audience that can just like laugh at the fact that you've been kicked off a mountain by the resident goat, I think that's really funny. Yeah, no, it it, it was good. And again, like I, I know I've said this before on on the show, but they're a good looking mob. Like they they really feel like a much more sophisticated mob compared to the sheep and the cows yeah. and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they really they really do um, sell it quite well. Uh, I didn't see any baby goats, but I also didn't stick around to breed them. I was more, I found the mountain biome. I was looking for a place that I could return to later and set up some cauldrons to collect some powder snow, right. which is another thing we've not been able to find uh, because the desert that I live in is massive. Like, I, live <laughs> yeah. in the middle of, I live in the Sahara. So like try, it took us forever to find this mountain biome. Uh, luckily, we also found spruce trees, so we now have saplings and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I didn't set up the cauldrons because I didn't, I wasn't going to stay there during that stream. But now we know where it is. Uh, you know, took a screenshot with the coordinates so we can return there and, and get some powder snow because the powder snow was another thing we were looking to do to add to the mob farm to see if that would be a faster way to kill the mobs and, and kind of get them out of, the, out of the mob farm. The mob farm doesn't do very well because, of course, I built it in a desert, not really thinking it through and realizing that husks don't burn up during the day. So mm. any husks that spawn on the surface at night they just stay around during the day. So the mob farm is just as slow during the day as it is at night. And uh, a more effective mob farm in the desert is just dig- digging a two block deep trench around your entire village and just <laughs> waiting for mobs to come and path to you. Yeah. They walk right into the trench and you just hack them and you're done. Like it, it, I was a little dismayed that it took me 45 minutes to dig a, dig a trench around the, around the town and it took me like three streams to complete the, <laughs> the mob farm. Like yeah. I was, yeah. It was a little bit frustrating. But in that that said, you know what other mob walks into the trench? Villagers. Yep. Yep, <laughs> so, they'll do that. And the wandering so trader we, and the llamas and yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we've had I had a few issues there. I also had to block up the nether portal because all I was like, where are all my villagers going? I'm not hearing them dying. There's iron golems everywhere. Go into the nether and there's like three villagers and four iron golems in the nether. It's like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need to put a door on that. 
Um, the other thing that we found uh, in a shipwreck on the way back was moss blocks. Oh, so we good! Finally, finally. Have, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we finally have moss blocks and azalea flowering bushes and like all the like all the things that come with the moss blocks. Uh, have not found uh, cave vines with the glow berries yet. I think that has to be a separate trade. Uh, I did get drip leaf from a wandering trader that happened in between streams. I was doing some mining just to kind of get myself some stuff and prepare for the next stream. And I happened to see the wandering trader couldn't resist. And I ended up getting some drip leaf. Haven't done anything with it yet. Uh, but the moss was really cool. And I would say anecdotally that the moss has, um, it, it's increased its radius. Like when you bone mill something in a nine by nine, it basically takes up all of the blocks. Yes, it, it really does moss uh, change a lot of moss uh, blocks into moss. Uh, doesn't affect cobble, which I didn't know, uh, but everything else was fair game. And I got a stack and a half of moss in I don't know seconds. Yeah, just yeah, with I, a I, hoe and some bone meal. I Not believe um, Il Mango recently put out a video saying that it didn't really show up in patch notes anywhere, but he would noticed a change in the way moss spreads, and it's now mm. a little bit more viable as a bone meal farm. If you want to to use that for um yeah ma making bo bone mealing moss and then making the bone meal back and then some it, it actually seems like it's going to be workable now and potentially even more usable for um for branch mines and, and mining downwards in that moss mining method that we explored mm -hmm. on the show and i explored on camera a while ago i think it also now i don't know if this was in the bedrock changelog that i spotted this or if it was in a java changelog but it will spread underneath blocks now which it didn't use they to did before that, yeah yeah so so you yeah. can actually use it to mine sideways a little bit more which in my opinion really improves the potential moss had uh, for use in applications like that so definitely like worth finding and getting hold of especially in 117 before lush caves and stuff i think the unfortunate thing about the uh glowberry situation is that you're not going to be able to bone meal the cave vines once you can plant glowberries because bone mealing them will produce more glowberries so obviously you can farm those in order to plant more but you're uh you're still going to have to um you know wait for the vines to grow before you can have longer vines in in much the same way that we wait for like swamp vines and jungle vines to grow um yeah so that's a little unfortunate but uh, yeah best of luck finding those because I, I expect it's it's an interesting scarcity and we talked about the scarcity of these things and how difficult it is to find stuff but i'm just glad that you're starting to find it at this point yeah no me too because it make, it makes things a little bit easier in terms of what we're going to do that that stream like are we like how are we going to set up like oh we, we got the bees now we have to set up the bee farm that gives us a good task for an hour to then start getting honeycomb so that we can start waxing copper blocks and and start experimenting with those so i have enough copper to actually start building with it now because of all the mining that i've done so now it'll be a, a cool idea of like okay well let's let's build something let's change these villager huts let's do a villager trading hall in the desert and decorate it with copper blocks and try to make it look cool and stuff like that so there'll be some things to do there um uh, the other thing that i noticed about the snapshot before i move on is that uh with silk touch now uh allowing me to grab bees nests and bring them back to um to my farm uh, i'm also noticing that i'm getting a lot of uh different blocks in my inventory when i'm going mining so there's two different types of iron ore two different types of redstone ore right like, yeah all the deep slate variants and all of a sudden you're like how am i running out of room in my inventory like i really went prepared for mining with a wide open empty inventory except for the essentials and it does not take long between deep slate cobbled deep slate i guess you don't get that if you get silk touch but then you've got you know stone coming in from just you know you're mining through stuff so you've got all the different types of stone plus then you have all the individual ore blocks now and uh until you get fortune because now i'm just like well i'm not gonna just smelt these because i know that if i get fortune i can just take them back to my home base with a different pickaxe and just really you know cash in on it um so it's it's one of those things where i'm just i just kind of notice okay yeah inventory is filling up a little bit faster than i would like you know with these new new variants and stuff because we are getting of course the deep slate blobs at the bottom uh, of the world around diamond level yeah, and and those are going to change up a little bit once uh you know 118 cave generation kicks in, but then of course you'll be going mm. below Y0 to get those anyway, and you won't see deep slate copper and uh, I think deep slate emerald might be off the table at that point. I can't remember exactly what yeah. still doesn't Maybe. generate below a certain height, but uh, yeah, even then you're still going to find that it might be more worth fortuning that stuff and smelting that or condensing it down into raw iron blocks and so forth before you. Uh, before you consider silk touching everything mm -hmm. 
the uh, the other thing that I I moved on to uh, in on the Citadel, of course, on the weekend was uh, that uh, Spice Merchant build that kicked my butt the weekend before. Uh-huh. I just took some time. I took some time away from it. Came back. We finished it up in about an hour. Like it just, it just you know, the roof needed some tweaking. I needed to do some balconies and some upstairs stuff. Uh, we tackled the inside, which was a lot of fun because I was using that uh, trapdoor method when you put like hay or like a hay bale or a um, sand block or a, a powdered concrete block uh in between trap doors it looks like a barrel of stuff yeah and so we have like you know bright red it looks like you know paprika and uh, and a bunch of other different things uh in in the build so uh, even a honey block actually looked quite cool uh white concrete powder looks like salt like that that kind of stuff um was really fun to put together uh, and then I spent the rest of the weekend, which uh, I, I guess I can attribute to my snapshot playthrough, uh, doing tactical stuff. I actually fixed all of the villager farms uh, that were built in 1.12 uh, <laughs> on on the main area in the Citadel because uh, they were the light activated villager farms uh, where the crops would pop off in low light. And of course, now you need a second villager for uh, the farmer to throw things at. Yeah, uh, and deal and deal with all that. Uh, the wheat farm still works the way that it was designed. It's one of those things where you fill a villager's inventory with seeds, and then they just can't pick up the wheat to make bread. They just constantly plant seeds, and and so the uh, hopper minecart that travels underneath the farm picks up all the wheat. So that worked fine. The problem with that is that I had to adjust for the seeds and the bone meal that the farmer would potentially make. If the hopper minecart got to it before the farmer would, it would mm-hmm. clog the pickup system. So I had, to, I had to filter out both bone meal and seeds to, to get that back to working. But the farm itself was functioning. It was the pickup system that was the problem. So It um, really, really starts to hit home how much mechanics like that have changed when you go and uh, yeah. redesign farms that were built a, cu- a few versions ago, which, you know, feels like, you know, no time at all ago if you've been playing for a little while. But, I mean, it's three years at this yeah. point since 1.13, oh, yeah. more or less. So, I mean, and I, and I designed them. So I, I spent the first half an hour of those streams going like, how do these work? Again? Yeah, like, right. <laughs> where, do, where do those hoppers go? Why are there so many hoppers? Because again, it was designed without water streams in mind, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, at least not at first. Uh, so it, it took a while to, to really kind of get things um, wrapped up. But um, I mean, a lot of that was due to the fact that villagers be villagers and they're hard to move around. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it was good. Uh, it was a nice break and really fun to take the now you know larger community and bring them back to the the older part of the server that's very built up and very fun to walk around like when you have to go get something from your storage system whatever you're walking through a a community of six or eight people that have built stuff everywhere and so it just it's a lot of fun to kind of look at stuff really helps the world feel alive at that stage right yeah Yeah. Uh, yeah for sure let's get into the news because i am interested to see how some of the news from this week is going to impact not just your snapshot playthrough but also other people's snapshot playthroughs and 117 as we know it uh so first of all the news is that minecraft turns 12 today uh minecraft was first released to the public back in the very very early days not talking about the 1.0 release but the pre-alpha the sort of you know first minecraft classic release was on may 17th 2009 so happy birthday minecraft ironic then that they have removed candles <laughs> um so minecraft java edition snapshot 21w 19a was released this week and I'll quote here from the Minecraft.net article. Starting with this snapshot, candles, bundles, and skulk sensors are only accessible through commands. We do not feel that they are at the quality we want for part one of the Caves and Cliffs release. To keep trying these features out in survival mode, use the preview data pack. Changes in 21W19A then include unfinished items, so skulk sensors, bundles, and candles, have been removed from the creative inventory. Geodes have also been made significantly rarer. The maximum length of item names in an Anvil UI has been increased from 35 to 50 characters, and recipes for the unfinished items, the skulk sensors, bundles, and candles, if they had a recipe in the first place, have now been removed. Uh, There are changes to the Caves and Cliffs preview data pack basically been updated to include the recipes related to bundles and candles, and a few technical changes have come to 21W19A as well. The game has been upgraded to run on Java 16, where previously it ran on Java 8. It has added mineable slash axe, mineable slash hoe, mineable slash pickaxe, and mineable slash shovel block tags, so that blocks with these tags can be destroyed more quickly with the matching tool. 
It's also added a need stone tool, needs iron tool, and needs diamond tool block tag. If a block requires the correct tool to drop, those tags determine which tier of that tool is required. The syntax of the slash item command has also been changed. So Java 16 uh, is now bundled with the version of Minecraft as you download it. So if you download 21w19a, it will automatically install Java and you'll be playing using the correct version. However, if you're using a custom Java setup or a third-party Minecraft launcher, you will need to take steps to ensure that your Java installation is version 16 or above. Uh, as far as the item command goes, the new syntax for the item command is detailed in the Minecraft.net article, so go ahead and read that if you're interested in brushing up on your commands. Aside from those, some fixed bugs of note in 21w19a. The full bug list is at the Minecraft.net article, but here are a few that we thought were worth mentioning. Uh, leads will now work with both squids and glow squids as of this snapshot. Uh, that's a couple of bugs there that have been fixed where they couldn't be leashed in Java edition. Withers would attack axolotls that were playing dead. That's also been fixed. Shulkers not spawning in the correct place in end cities has now been fixed as well. And despite being a type of berry plant, bees did not pollinate cave vines. That has also been addressed in this snapshot. The Hidden Depths DLC is arriving for Minecraft Dungeons. Minecraft Dungeons is making a splash on May 26th with the next DLC, Hidden Depths. This won't be your average day at the beach, though. You'll have to fight a spreading corruption that has reached the darkest depths of the ocean. Of course, there's also plenty of free content and updates coming alongside the DLC release. Not only are there new enchantments, but there is also a brand new feature called Raid Captains. Super challenging new enemies that will change the way you play the game. Seek out raid captains where they lurk in the hidden corners of the world and add a new level of challenge and additional treasures to your missions. So before we get into discussing the uh, caves and cliffs changes, let's talk Minecraft Dungeons briefly, because I know you, you haven't really had much of a chance to uh, play, especially with some of the, the newer DLC. So is this going to potentially draw you back into Minecraft Dungeons, or are you still just finding the time to tackle the base game? I do need I need to get back into it because I know I like the game and right now I I need to just do that homework of uh, doing the cloud safe thing and playing with the newer character or the uh, more up to date playthrough on the console. I'm still torn as to where I'm going to start purchasing any of the DLC that I do not own yet. Uh, I don't think that this would be as much of a decision for me if I didn't stream Minecraft Dungeons previously. Uh, if streaming wasn't a thing I even did, I would probably be playing on console because of the work that I do on computers I really do want something that's kind of console based for like that that chill relaxed thing um, I've noticed uh, a lot in my evenings that I've been struggling to make a decision as to what to watch on Netflix what to play on Xbox Game Pass and having something that's a little bit more pick up put down like Minecraft Dungeons would be a great addition to that uh, so as I look forward to the new expansions and trying to get into that, I think I'm going to give the console a go mm -hmm. and see if that's something that will be kind of like the new home for Minecraft Dungeons for me. Um, as far as my original playthrough character goes, I'm stuck on the last boss of the first playthrough, like the the, the Arch Illager thing. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't returned to that since the first couple of tries. So I, I think it's just a matter of, of going back to that and, and either starting the level over again or just coming at it with a different set of um, either skills or trinkets or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to trying that on the console. I, I mean, I don't have a lot to go off of other than just the uh, splash art that they've included in the Minecraft.net article for the hidden depths, but uh, looks cool. Like, and Minecraft is Minecraft Dungeons is already a very pretty game. And I can imagine with some of the cool game mechanics that I watched in the, what was the peaks one the in the mountains? Was Howling Peaks. peaks? Howling Peaks, that was close. Yeah. Um, things like, you know, freezing into an ice cube or the vistas and the different depths that they were able to, to share. Uh, underwater stuff, I'm not sure how they're going to handle it. There is a character or two swimming in in this um, uh, in in this screen art, so I don't know if that's just for immersion or whether you're actually going to get to swim in hidden depths. I don't know. Uh, I'm imagining a throwback to, like, Super Mario 
to <laughs> with all the swimming levels. Mm-hmm. Water levels are always people's favorite part of any video game. We've heard that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, they look cool. There's there's a cool looking coral skeleton that's all mossy. There's uh, looks like a trident king in the show in the art for the article. Like I I'm in, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do. Uh, the squid helmet for one of the main characters also looks really fun. Yeah. Like, I think they've adapted some of the stuff that's already in vanilla minecraft like the turtle shell helmet and stuff is in there i think those are uh those are pretty cool mm. looking but um yeah I, i'm i'm excited for this as well i've really enjoyed everything that they've done with minecraft dungeons since release so i'm definitely looking forward to it i will aim to play it if i have the time because uh, obviously right now I'm just very busy finishing up stuff in uh 1.16 vanilla but um yeah i would encourage anybody who wants to get a sneak peek at dlc to first of all if you go to the minecraft youtube channel the latest um ask mojang video was with the dungeons team so there is a little bit of sneaky footage in there from the ocean dlc um so so check that out alternatively if you're a twitter user follow them at dungeons game on twitter or just search minecraft dungeons on twitter you'll find the account pretty easily they do have a couple of short videos shared on twitter that shows a little bit of the gameplay which i expect will probably be fleshed out into a longer dev diary video if they have that planned for the youtube channel but um yeah it seems like there are mechanics involving your player character needing air so you need to create air pockets or find bubbles uh to to refresh your oxygen i assume there will be some enchantments that allow you to get around that or some armor you can wear that makes you immune to that maybe water breathing potions or something like that because i can expect that would get old pretty fast if it's not implemented well um and yeah it looks like there's there's going to be a little bit of if not swimming then at least the kind of riptide roll uh is going to be used instead of the typical roll that you would have on the other dungeons levels it, you're going to kind of do a a little spin in the water and be able to leap from gap to gap uh using that so they've changed up a little bit of how the game feels to play it looks like but hopefully it should be a really entertaining dlc and i'm looking forward to it now uh yeah <laughs> let, let, let's let's <laughs> talk about this um so they've removed candles bundles and skulk sensors from the 1.17 release they said they don't feel that they are the quality they want for part one of the caves and cliffs release note that this does not explicitly say they are being saved for part two only that they aren't the quality they want for part one and we can presume that that means they'll be working on them up to the caves and cliffs part two release but i know a few people have been concerned with what king b dog said on twitter a little while ago about whether the warden was right for the update and that they didn't really have like a release schedule in mind for the warden and the deep dark they just wanted to be happy with it and it would be released sort of when it was done so that's got some people thinking maybe that's not coming in part two of caves and cliffs which if it's potentially going to be later than that means i would imagine the skulk sensor is going to be delayed even further i don't want to you know start people with pitchforks kind of coming out of the woodwork at this stage like we we don't know for certain i imagine the plan is still to release them as part of the caves and cliffs update but as we know from previous weeks plans change um so this is a little disappointing as the kind of main news here um but I can in, I can understand them holding back skulk sensors in particular because of the environment not being there, and they have the potential to be very powerful in terms of a redstone feature, but I think there isn't really a great place for us to find them in Caves and Cliffs Part 1. We've been finding, you know, stuff in various shipwrecks. You found moss blocks and glow berries, maybe in abandoned mine shafts and things like that, but there there isn't really a sensible place to find something both as powerful and as alien as a skulk sensor unless you maybe temporarily added them to like end city loot or something like that which might not work for the the lore of the game um so so we can expect to find them added in with the environment that they are used to the skulk kind of area of the deep dark which is going to occur much later on i'm not surprised in that the reason that they gave didn't surprise me for the removal of of these and uh probably least surprised about the skulk sensor for all the reasons that you just outlined uh but i know that with data packs in the game if they were even if they were not included in the in the survival game uh if they were in the game at all people would just uh, as far as skulk sensors go just add in a data pack to make them yeah right yeah and, and and so you'd end up with people using skulk sensors for the next few months 
building stuff and then potentially complaining when skulk, skulk sensors are eventually released and they're different or yeah. they work mm -hmm. differently or they're different features. Uh, so, I mean, I can understand the skulk sensors for, for sure. Uh, the stuff that puzzles me are things like candles um, yeah. because I, there's must be some grand plan that I don't see because while again, I can't argue with the reason of we want to make these things better. We don't think they're ready. That's a valid reason to not put them in the snapshots or in the game uh, to release the summer. But what about candles didn't work? Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. and not to be cheeky, but I'm just like it's a candle. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> like, that's my thoughts about it as well. Like I and I don't I don't want to assume too much because we've already seen them say they didn't push part two of Caves and Cliffs to the end of the year so they could add a ton of extra stuff. Yes. But the only reasons I can think of to remove candles and bundles is that they either have extra functionality or a change to functionality in mind, or maybe they plan on changing the crafting recipes to include ingredients which won't be in 117, which for candles doesn't make a great deal of sense because, you know, it's it's honeycomb and wax and and and, and string for a wick that's you know the, the you don't really need a whole lot that, and, and honeycomb is clearly being used analogously with wax because that's how you wax copper so they, they're clearly used to that and i don't see them needing to add any other materials for candles to be crafted um i can see them wanting to give more depth to candles though because while they are a lovely decoration they have 17 different color options but we have a lot of other light sources in Minecraft and the candles didn't stand out as being particularly unique. Uh, so while I don't see the recipe changing much, I see potentially the functionality changing there. Um, it's almost the other way round with bundles because I was happy with bundles and I wonder if they're being held back so maybe their functionality can be altered to fit broader player expectation because mm -hmm. I know there were still some people who thought who who went, okay, I understand what bundles are meant to be for. I still don't expect I will use them. I don't see the point because I can just throw stuff in a chest instead of throwing stuff in a bundle. It doesn't resolve the problem fully. It just makes my inventory mess kind of hidden, and then it's still a mess when I open the bundle back up again. Um, yep. I also maybe see them altering the crafting recipe for people who are unable or unwilling to hunt down rabbits because... I feel like rabbits are one of those borderline animals, unlike a cow, where more people would consider them pets. And even though you can't tame them in the same way that you can cats or dogs, rabbits are still kind of adorable animals. And I imagine a bunch of kids running around killing rabbits maybe aren't are going to have mixed feelings about that situation. Um, so I'm I'm curious about the reasons behind bundles and candles not feeling ready to the developers. Um, one more angle on this. Um, that I hadn't considered until right before we started the show was that none of these three delayed features, Skulk Sensors, uh, but maybe Skulk Sensors have been actually, so so maybe I'm wrong there, but I'm pretty sure Bundles and Candles have not been implemented in development versions of Bedrock Edition yet. And while there is obviously precedent several times in the past for Java and Bedrock receiving different features at different times, the team does seem to want to unify when features are released between the two versions. So... Uh, while I don't want to point the finger at Bedrock in particular, and I would be f fine being corrected about this, I, I do wonder if they're proving problematic for the Bedrock team to implement, and that might be why we aren't, you know, we, we haven't seen them iterate on bundles and candles in Java over the last little while, like they're testing things. So maybe they're just trying to wait for the Bedrock team to get around to working on bundles and candles and finding a way to implement them well because i'm not sure how it would apply to candles but i think the bundle would be really difficult to use on mobile with the functionality that it has in java edition right now the differentiating between left clicking and right clicking to use a bundle might be a little bit more difficult for people who play with a touch screen so yeah yeah th like those are the reasons i feel like i can imagine for them delaying bundles candles and skulk sensors but aside from that it does seem a little bit disappointing that we don't have more information on this. The only other thing that I would add to candles being delayed uh, as a purely speculation, I have no information on this whatsoever, is just that it is a light block and it is a light block which operates very similar to uh, sea pickles, which is the more candles you put down, the greater the light uh, coming out of that block. 
uh, which means that you could potentially have a lot of different light levels in an area depending on how many candles you wanted to spam around. Uh, and I'm wondering if that might be poking its head as a performance issue when you combine it with caves and cliffs and some of the other performance issues that we've seen in, in the last few weeks. So uh, as a light block, I can see that being a little complicated uh, and, and maybe needs, you know, maybe need some work there as just an idea as to one reason why they may be uh, delayed. Um, as far as the parity between Bedrock and Java go, uh, I'm hoping that one thing that does not get crossed off the Java list is the goat horn, provided that there are more, you know, if there's going to be more development of it or if there's going to be included to have some other functions. Um, as of yet, uh, that's something that has has been released on the Bedrock side as far as the snapshot goes, a beta, uh, but has not on the Java side. I, I'm curious about what they're going to do with the goat horn at this point. We do have an email about the goat horn a little bit later as well. But yeah, it, it's because it's not popped up in Java yet. I am I am curious. I'm not entirely optimistic. <laughs> but then I, once again, I'm, I'm absolutely fine with them delaying whatever they want to as long as it comes out a more functional and usable thing at some point in future. <laughs> like I'm 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 entirely cool with that. Uh, it's it's just interesting that they can't say much more than we're just not happy with this right now. They haven't told us why they're not happy with it specifically. I expect yeah. because they get pushback from players saying, but we're happy with that, so like, do stuff to please us instead of following your own <laughs> kind of developmental and artistic uh, intentions at that point. Um, yeah, I'm not sure really what else to say about this. And I don't want it to be too negative of a discussion, but yeah, I, I do think that... If they're still available via commands, again, data pack making community, correct me if I'm wrong, but it should still be possible to add all of these items back in using a data pack. I mean, that's effectively, it's what the Caves and Cliffs update data pack does, right? right. Um, like if, if you're playing the latest snapshot with the data pack, you can still craft bundles, etc. So I expect a good handful of players, if they were excited about these things coming in 117, they could still add those in. If you're excited to use it in its unfinished state, you could certainly give it a try. That might then mean that your stuff breaks, especially if it comes to skulk sensors. But I I can't see a reason for people not to do that as long as they're happy adapting their approach to these things later on. And that's where I would sit on it. I, I can't see myself using skulk sensors for a heck of a lot because I, I'd be curious to know more about how they're going to be refined and put into the game eventually in their final state before doing anything elaborate with them. Uh, I don't experiment a lot with redstone. I tend to do the same sort of things, a lot of functionality as opposed to just like, because I can. Uh, and I can achieve a lot of the things I want to achieve, I think, without skulk sensors in the time being. Uh, I'm more of a builder. So candles are something that I, I would consider. You know, I talk to my server mates on the Citadel and say like, hey, if we added a data pack that added candles, knowing that it could potentially be messed up and 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 we have to redo some things later would everybody be okay with that and i would imagine that the answer i would get uh from the majority would be yes because we already have a data pack that we use on the server uh called uh tables and chairs from a creator called chuck chuck and uh chuck chuck recently put out a new version that meant basically you had to go around you had to get a new texture pack uh and then go around to your old tables and chairs and kind of like break them and replace them uh not a big deal if you've used a handful, but a little bit more, you know, time consuming if you had a big table or a lot of these things around. Um, but it, the, the the improvement in the data pack was worth the, you know, half an hour it took to run around and replace tables and chairs. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it'll be an interesting landscape. There, there might be more room in 117 for customization. And that goes as far as the Java 16 change as well. Uh, Java 16 is going to be a big deal for a lot of people. It's kind of outside of our realm of expertise, so we won't dwell on this for long. But my understanding is that adding a more modern and sophisticated version of Java will be really invaluable to mod makers, uh, as well as I'm sure the devs themselves. Um, and previously the game ran on a version of Java which was released in 2014. Java 16, by comparison, was released in March 2021. Uh, and as I understand it, thanks to uh, Will Run for Fun in our Discord for pointing us to this earlier in the week, uh, this is now effectively a Microsoft build of the open Java dev kit uh, that they're using to develop Java 16 for Minecraft. So it's um, it's a free open source version, but potentially more accessible to developers like Mojang who are under the Microsoft umbrella 
and potentially sustainable in terms of support through Microsoft if Oracle, who develops Java, stops supporting Java 16 so it moves on to future versions. Um, so yeah, potentially this means yeah, a code structure is being made more easy. Uh, there's yeah, a, a, a discussion amongst those people who know about this type of thing is is happening in our Discord right now. And yeah, it's potentially an exciting time for anybody who's planning on maybe sitting on version one seventeen as a landscape for modded Minecraft for the foreseeable future. Considering that one eighteen is going to add in a ton of stuff that breaks a lot of the way existing mods work because of the changes in world height and all of the world gen stuff basically gonna is gonna mess with a lot of stuff that modded minecraft likes to do so yeah it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how java 16 is received by the modded community i might try and keep my finger on the pulse a little closer uh over the next little while and see how they uh how they end up using that yeah, and I think that the benefit to players that maybe are not, you know, under the hood in that kind of way is that if you are, you know, a heavy modded Minecraft player, you might have your mods update to new versions of Minecraft sooner. You know, mm -hmm. you might have more options coming to you as as time rolls on. Uh, I'm curious to see if there's going to be a performance improvement going to 16 over the older versions of Java. Uh, that's more just anecdotal for me, just because I do struggle with, you know, frame setters and stuff from time to time. I'm convinced it's mostly hardware on my computer. But uh, if a game is going to run more efficiency, efficiently, it's going to tax the hardware less. So it could be a benefit to me as well. Yeah, there, there are potentially new Java arguments that you can use for garbage collection and stuff as well. So like, you know, dumping out all of the stuff that the RAM is doing and refreshing that every so often. I find that a lot of the time when I experience those lag spikes, it tends to be like it topping out the amount of RAM that it's using, which, uh, right. you know, ca cannot be the smoothest of processes. So there, there might be some other uh, arguments that you can add to the uh, Java launcher, which might adjust little things here and there but again something to keep my ear to the ground about in the next little while because i know next to nothing about what's what's out there uh before we get too far away from ourselves though let's move on to chunk mail uh this week is going to be a chunk mail dispense episode because it's the middle episode of this month more or less and a bunch of you have written in so thank you so much for your emails uh, why don't you get us started joel if you would like to be one of these fine folks to have your email read on the show, you can send that in to spunchunkmail at gmail.com. First email is from Doug K, the signpost up ahead. Hi, Joel and Johnny. I am currently playing in a seed where I can't find a jungle to save my life. I'd really like a signpost in game instead of the divine intervention, i.e. using a map app or find where to go another way. Uh, how about a high level cartographer trade for a map to a random rare biome? After all, if the game can give me a map to a woodland mansion that may be literally thousands of blocks away, how about a map to a jungle? Also, I may have to work through several cartographers up to max level before I get the biome I want, so it wouldn't be super easy this way. Achievement earned. Sent email to the Spawn Chunks. Yours, Doug. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Uh, we did mention this last week, actually, how uh, I thought having a map to a jungle temple would just end up being a map to a jungle biome for most players, um, since the temple itself doesn't have any uh, unique loot or mobs. So while I... Yeah, I, I don't know if they want to provide maps to specific biomes. It could be an interesting workaround. And personally, I'm in favor. The jungles on my Survival Guide World Seed are both about 3,000 blocks out. And at that sort of range, uh, I've definitely been on servers where this has been the case as well. The angle that you explore at, say you just pick a direction and you go that way, it gets less and less likely that you're going to find a jungle just by exploring in that direction because the jungle is always a few degrees off <laughs> but then as you you know keep exploring then the uh, the angle kind of widens out and you're missing the jungle by like a greater degree each each uh, block you travel so it, it can be very difficult to find jungles without say having a light train flying around more freely or the the best tips i can provide are to find a desert or a savanna and explore the boundaries of those because Minecraft likes to group together biomes of a similar temperature and the jungle is grouped in with deserts and savannas as a hot biome. But outside of that, yeah, I think it would be a good idea to have more accessibility for those biomes, especially considering the jungle is hiding an entire wood type that you can't really get anywhere else. 
Mm -hmm. The jungle saplings that I have on my snapshot playthrough, I got from a wandering trader <laughs> because I've not been able to find them mm -hmm. anywhere else. Uh, and I should also note that uh, I have a iceberg frozen ocean biome directly adjacent to my desert. Oh yeah, no, yeah, ocean, ocean biomes are the, a whole separate <laughs> kettle of fish. Okay, They're... completely different kettle of fish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like the idea of maybe splitting the difference because there's some excitement about flying through the world or traveling across the world and finding the desert or finding a badlands or uh, working through that kind of stuff. Uh, however, I do think it would be nice to have some sort of high-level cartographer. Uh, especially because you don't necessarily need these things until later in the game, point you towards the very rare biomes like an eroded badlands, ice spikes, mushroom island, like stuff that you might want a little bit later for more technical reasons or for, you know, other blocks, that kind of stuff, uh, I think might be uh, a good way to split the difference. Like I don't want to necessarily find a map to a flower forest or a birch forest. Like, I mean, you can find those kind of on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I do find it difficult sometimes thinking about these kind of things because I, I want there to be that kind of discovery. There's a lot of fun, you know, when you come across a swamp, when you're looking for vines and, you know, blue lily, you know, light blue flowers and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, um, it's hard to figure out like where you want to be with that kind of discovery. What I did on the Citadel, uh, because we were heading into it with a bunch of very busy adults wanting to save some time, I did load the seed up into uh, a chunk base to kind of make sure that we had the essential immediate biomes. I wasn't necessarily looking for really rare stuff. I just wanted ice for farms, sand for glass, and uh, I think we wanted all the different wood types. So we wanted to make sure there was a jungle and a dark oak forest nearby spawn, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, what I didn't do, though, was like mark down coordinates and tell everybody where they were. So when sure. I went looking for the ice spikes biome, I knew it was north, but I just did, I really didn't give myself anything else like that. So I still went looking for it in game and I did find it, but it was fun for me to say like, well, it's north, but I didn't really like I didn't know how far I didn't know whether it was, you know, it saved me from going either east, west or south and for hundreds of blocks without finding anything at least i found it within you know a few hours yeah i and i i like exploration in this game a lot and i'm i'm fine giving it a, a kind of free pass when it comes to encouraging players to explore the world but i i do find myself relying on mapping software to find that kind of stuff just for the sake of convenience more than anything i think once you've played for a little while especially you know what a jungle is it's less of a kind of exciting thing when you stumble upon one just in terms of discovery if you start to see a biome as resources instead of just a new location then that's the point at which you want to know how to find those resources as efficiently as possible so mm. yeah I, I think it's an interesting discussion um and thinking about the maps that cartographers trade actually made me wonder if the woodland mansion itself might end up being revisited in future since after the village and pillage update it doesn't really have anything truly unique about it anymore um when they were added woodland mansions were the only place you could encounter illagers this was back in 1.11 or 1.10 i believe um but now illagers can be farmed using raids and the only thing woodland mansions tend to provide is uh, vindicators that don't despawn even if you haven't name tagged them which i guess if you want those for a mob switch or something is fair enough but then um that's a fairly technical thing, and the only other thing you can really get from a woodland mansion, aside from the same sort of loot you'd find in a desert temple or a abandoned mine shaft, is a way to have vindicator and evoker encounters without jeopardizing the safety of a village by doing a raid. And so I I wonder maybe if there is room for woodland mansions to provide something else in future that makes them really worth going potentially tens of thousands of blocks to find. Hmm. But uh, yeah, thanks for the email, Doug. Uh, I, I I like it as an extension of last week's topic. Uh, moving on to uh, the second email. This one comes from Jokera, or Joker A, not sure. Uh, the subject, the missing blocks of Caves and Cliffs Update Part 1. Not a reference to Skulk Sensors et al. Or we will read on. Uh, hello, Johnny and Joel. As 1.17 begins to wrap up development, I can't help but feel that this update is missing blocks that, at least to me, should have been no-brainers by now. Tough and calcite, while neat blocks to add to the list of decorative stones, feel underdeveloped with missing stairs, slabs, walls, and polished versions. Dripstone is another block that I think could make for a really good overworld version of basalt, but still seemingly is just getting the one block. 
I don't think that these not having variants is necessarily bad, but with how the Nether update did the same thing by leaving behind red Nether bricks and quartz brick variants, I can't help but feel this is setting a precedent going forward that I feel is not exactly healthy for the game. I'd like to know how you feel about these seemingly missing blocks, and probably by the time you've read this, most of those will already exist. Keep up the great work, Jokera. Uh, thank you for the email, Jokera. Um, so, yeah, we have tuff and calcite, um, dripstone, and I think basalt can also be bundled into this because we've just had the addition of smooth basalt to wrap around geodes, replacing tuff, which is now more freely more freely available in the the underside of the world, and. Um, but smooth basalt is at least renewable, but doesn't have any variants to my knowledge. Um, so let's start with your opinions, Joel. How do you feel about uh, the lack of tough and calcite stairs and slabs? Refresh my memory. How is smooth basalt renewable? Uh, you can farm basalt, and then I think to get smooth basalt, you smelt it, as opposed to crafting it in oh, a two by two right. to get right. the um, the basalt column block. I forget. Is that that's like cut basalt or polished basalt i forget i forget which one yeah. you, you, you polish it if it's in a two by two and you get smooth if you've smelted it in a furnace right and that's yeah that's that's on par with getting smooth sandstone as well i should include in on that uh i i on one hand i agree with uh joker being you know like where's the rest of these blocks but also there's obviously enough blocks in the update that i'm forgetting what has what function uh, so like it's, it's, it's a glass, half empty glass, half full kind of situation sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, or overflowing. Um, I forget that tough and calcite are in the game most of the time. Uh, and I think that, uh, partly because I haven't found a geode naturally yet in the playthrough, um, when the snapshot that included geodes and calcite and tough first came out i do remember bopping around in a creative snapshot world and looking at stuff and liking it uh but depending on what you want to use it for when something is only available in just a single block uh, that has such an appealing texture like calcite uh, or a darker stone texture like uh, deep slate even though i'm not the biggest fan i know there are other people out there that that do want to use it for a lot of things um when you get into calcite and tough not having stairs and slabs and, and stuff uh, i can see sort of the um the frustration especially with calcite with calcite you're just like well like this this really feels like a good marble kind of substitute or, or as best as we have right now and you'd want to be able to do really cool decorative things with it it's a very pretty block tough i don't really think that we need necessarily slabs and, and stairs and tough i think that maybe for landscaping you know slabs would be nice but i'm not really upset that they're not there um the problem that i have with deep slate and all the different polished and versions with the stairs and slabs is that i have even trouble differentiating between deep slate and cobble deep slate as blocks on their own yeah i don't find the directionality very intuitive uh i tried to build something in the nether really quick just to kind of give myself a safe little nine by nine to, to pop out of the portal in and i use deep slate because i just happen to have a lot of it from the mining in my snapshot play playthrough and I thought I was putting down deep slate and cobble deep slate with deep slate columns and cobble deep slate wall fill. I had this thing entirely backwards because it turns out that cobble deep slate looks smoother than deep slate vertically. Uh -huh. Just what, what? Why? Like just so it doesn't really feel that intuitive. And then it starts to remind me about Blackstone when you've got, I don't know how many different, 27 different variants of Blackstone in your inventory in terms of walls and slabs and stairs. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell the difference until you hover over and read the 35 character long name that they've given the block. Yeah. So uh, Deep Slate is going to run into those same problems. If you've got cobbled and smooth and polished versions of all those things, I will say that polished Deep Slate is very easy to spot. Like that stands out you know, on its own. Um, but I've not played with it much because I just find that it's all, it all just seems so samey, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, I feel, I feel like that's one thing that they could do if, if there is any kind of player feedback that's saying like, man, this is feeling pretty underwhelming, you know, this summer update, I feel like adding stairs and slabs to some of these things could be a, a way to help make it feel more robust. Yeah, I, I saw King B-Dog's tweet this earlier about there, effectively, if you include stair and slab variants of stuff like copper, there are something like 91 blocks being added, which is more blocks than the nether update had in the first place. But that's, I think, because there are, you know, all these different variants of copper and each of those has stairs and slabs attached to it as well. So I feel like in terms of blocks, if people aren't 
super happy at this point, then they're probably not going to be happy at all. Uh, they're, they're more interested in the natural generation stuff that's being delayed. But my perspective on this is really that stairs, slabs, walls, etc. can all be added in future. Like, I know it's disappointing not to have them now, but it doesn't mean we'll never get them. Um, and consider that as far as, like, the decorative stone types and a site and granite and so forth were added back in 1.8, and didn't have wall and stair crafting recipes until 1.14. And that doesn't necessarily mean that Mojang is going to follow that pattern and just delay those blocks having stairs and slabs until like a few years down the line for the sake of dragging it out for, for builders. I think it, it mostly comes down to what they feel there is a need for. And right now, if you want calcite stairs, there are you know diorite stairs and quartz stairs, which are obviously not going to be the same texture and for some people that's going to be really annoying but they are close enough maybe that mojang doesn't feel the need um personally my main wish is for a crafting recipe that gets us renewable calcite uh maybe if you combine ameth amethyst shards and diorite you get renewable calcite for the kind of closest uh you know equivalents because tough we will find in excess in those kind of blobs um, below Y0 and probably around uh, Y16 to Y0 in 117 worlds. Uh, smooth Basalt we can get renewably. Calcite is the, the holdout, and Calcite I think is the nicest block of the three in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd still like to use it in place of just straight up building blocks a lot more frequently. Um, I think in terms of the stair slab wall argument, it may also depend on like they might prioritize materials which are more commonly used in construction and what era they are used in construction so when this email came in i was doing a bit of research and um i think deep slate variants make the most sense for variants of stairs and slabs and so forth because in real life slate is a fairly commonly used material for roofs for wall cladding other features of buildings you know floors even and um, Slate has a lot of applications and is relatively common. From a, a quick Wikipedia search, uh, tuff is also used in construction and has been since ancient times, but it's made from expelled volcanic ash, layering up and then solidifying. There is a more accurate geological term for this, but uh, it's more common in areas with volcanic activity like Italy. Uh, there are some houses in Germany that use tuff in their construction as well. Um, and it's a fairly soft material to work with, so it has proven fairly malleable and usable in construction, but the tough in-game has a texture that doesn't necessarily resemble, you know, cut tough in the, in the real world. So I sort of wonder if maybe it is occupying a different space in Mojang's idea of what the geology of the world looks like. And it's the kind of thing that we are effectively just now discovering tough, but then in a few updates time in the lore of the world, it might be like, okay, players now know enough about this new block that they can learn to build with it a little better and maybe it becomes a little bit easier to work with. Um, calcite, on the other hand, is a mineral more kind of gem-like in its formation. Um, this is again from Wikipedia saying the uh, ancient Egyptians used to carve items out of calcite and i think it's often compared with or, or used in the same applications as alabaster um and in more modern times a more translucent variety of calcite is used for a variety of things but it feels like it uh it, it's more of a fragile kind of material and is more delicate and would relate more to the upcoming archaeology features even than it does to building blocks and then dripstone being the last example is basically made out of the same stuff as calcite. They're all kind of uh, different variations on calcium carbonate. So I feel like each of these have room in the geology of Minecraft that makes a whole lot of sense right now. But maybe to the developers, those materials don't make sense as building blocks until they've existed in the world for a little bit longer and we have more of a chance to understand them. I, I do wonder if maybe there's a justification for leaving this stuff until it's had some time to age. They've seen how players are going to use those blocks and maybe if they feel there is a need amongst the player base for stairs and slabs and walls, they can think about adding them in future, but adding it all right now when players are going to say, well, that just looks like an andesite wall. I don't really bother with them because I, I can't really tell the difference. Then maybe it's worth not worrying about putting the effort in and adding those to the game when they're 
unlikely to get used by everybody. And I think to the other issue that arises immediately in my brain is the is the inventory problem yes. of, of just <laughs> managing all of these different things, right? When you want to build something that's got deep slate, uh, tough calcite, your own stone, different woods, pick whatever you want. I mean, if you've got stairs and slabs and walls and like you just, you're talking about like 12 shulker boxes, you're going to haul around with you if you want to do all that kind of stuff. And several uh, bundles and just, if we still had them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. There's a lot of, a lot of things in there that could be, could be I'm, problematic. I'm stirring the pot now, Joel. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I liked the bundles. I'm going to, I'm going to bring it up at every opportunity. Uh, we should move on though. Let's, uh, let's get the next email out of the way. Next one is from King Berlius. I hope I pronounced that right. Goats and horns is the subject. After episode 140, I've been wondering about the horns of goats. If they were to drop and be used, I think it would be great uh, auditory implementation. Purely having jukeboxes and note blocks feels clunky and immobile. Audio is such a big part of games. What other more portable auditory items and or methods would you like to see uh, in addition to Minecraft. Uh, and the sign out, forgive me, <laughs> King Barilus. 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 King Barilus. I'm sorry. I'm imagining that as like the the movie trailer inception Blah! kind of uh, noise. Um, yeah. So, so goat horns, currently in Bedrock Edition, one of the only things you can do with them is... Uh, you hold down right click and it plays a pillager horn sound effect. Uh, that doesn't seem to have any kind of functionality. It doesn't scare villagers to hear it as far as we know. Um, but I think there is potential for goat horns. I think it's it's an interesting area of Minecraft to flesh out because we obviously have the ability to make music with note blocks and those are objects that you can kind of place in world and it will play automatically if you have it on a loop with a redstone circuit rather than it having to be played live but i feel like there is interesting potential for multiplayer jam sessions and things like that to break out if you are now introducing effectively a woodwind instrument uh to to the game or, or a horn type instrument in the form of using goat horns i'm not sure how you would tune them but it could be an interesting opportunity to improve upon the musicality of minecraft in an update that's already talking about adding sound effects that have you know uh ramifications on blocks like the skulk sensor and uh, mobs like the warden there are going to be potentially more applications for sound in future so a goat horn might be an interesting one to expand upon and i think too that you know having other functionality in the game uh that centers around sound like the villager bell you know being able to hit that and having all the villagers run to their houses um stuff like that i think is is interesting especially because players can interact with it either up close or by shooting it with an arrow or using redstone uh i'm wondering if there's a way to fold the goat horn into something redstone related we mentioned this uh with regards to copper pipes a few weeks ago in the show what if a goat horn could be put into a combination with a note block and change it from a staccato MIDI sort of sound to something more sustainable? Uh, the more goat horns you have in a note block, perhaps perhaps it goes from a quarter note to a half note to a whole note. I'm I'm uh, imagining you know. them looking like gramophones too, like yep, the the big old too. like brass horn coming out the top of it. Maybe yep. maybe that could be another use for copper. You you combine yep. copper and a goat horn, and you effectively get a phonograph. <laughs> I feel like that'd be that's that's taking Minecraft in a whole different technological direction. But we already have music discs, so we're effectively yep. there already. And if imagine if you have you know someone uh, able to hit a note block, uh, you have a bunch of people all lined up you know on your multiplayer server, and it's basically like the Oompa Loompa band. Like you get somebody <laughs> with a tuba, you get somebody with a xylophone, uh, maybe somebody with like an eight, eight bit like chime going, something like that it could be very very fun. Um, but it did get me thinking about other musical instruments that could be built as like an item in Minecraft, and we already make bows, so something like a harp or a lute mm -hmm. would not be that far off. Uh, and I'm wondering if there could be something something used there to subdue or calm an angry mob. Maybe if you play gentle harp music when you travel over the mountains, the goats will leave you alone. Uh, <laughs> I, maybe it'll attract creepers. Like I, you know, there could be a there could be a push and pull. Like you could use it to deter zombies and skeletons, but maybe creepers are attracted to the pretty music and want to come give you a hug. I don't know. Um, it also made me think about a minstrel villager, which unfortunately had me singing Toss a Coin to Your Witcher in my head. I'm still mad about it. <laughs> so 
uh, yeah, there's that, uh, which I think would be kind of a fun way to implement that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, you're, you're into music. You have done a lot of musical stuff in, in your life. What kind of musical instruments would you like to see added to Minecraft? Honestly, yeah, I think we are missing out on stuff like woodwind. Um, I think in terms of the the range of stuff that is available with note blocks, I think one of them is a flute, which sounds like a fairly basic kind of MIDI flute. Um, but there there is definitely room for expansion. You know, you can can fit an entire orchestra. The th- the thing is, like you said, it's it's not so much about the instrumentation; it's about being able to sustain notes and have things that aren't just playing staccato the whole time which could be an interesting application for for the goat horn or for anything else. I I also kind of wonder we taking this on a, a slightly different tangent. We may have had a a listener email about this before, but somebody suggested blowing the goat horn could potentially deafen the warden for a while, allowing mm. you to escape a little bit. What if the harp suggestion that you had did something similar but it maybe calmed the warden a little bit like you you, you had the the goat idea, but I'm wondering if in a kind of music soothing the uh, the beast kind of way, if mm-hmm. uh, if you know playing playing a harp could make the warden kind of stop and contemplate life a little bit <laughs> instead of instead of running immediately at you and and barreling over you. Um, I don't know if there is you know much else I can say about the instrumentation in Minecraft. It's it's gotten fairly eclectic over the years between you know adding a didgeridoo because they had one for the pillager horn. There's a banjo in there now. I think a lot of it aside from just basic strings like a a violin or a cello or something it uh it it's got most of the stuff there already uh i i will i will put in a nod to the saxophone because i was a saxophonist at one point uh so i'd I'd be interested in turning the goat horn into one of those (laughs) eventually but uh yeah maybe there's a chance for the goat horn to have a a role in that in future one thing that I did start talking about on a recent stream with the snapshot was uh, how cool things like copper, deep slate. Uh, I haven't had a chance to play with uh, uh, geodes in, in in this particular playthrough, but I do remember they also have a really cool block noise. And so to get away from musical instruments, but also just kind of uh, throw out that idea of more sounds coming in Caves and Cliffs Part 1 could also be a, a way to help make some of these blocks feel a little bit more special uh, and having them either affect note blocks uh, either or just have um, different footsteps or like different things that you could do um, to use things like I mean calcite maybe we don't get slabs and stairs but like if it makes a very unique footprint sound when you run across it that could be at least something to make it feel different than just another stone block you know yeah I'm also wondering if there's a chance for more auditory experiences to be added in Minecraft that feel a bit more natural. Think about, like, finding a seashell and holding it up to your ear and hearing that kind of rushing sound that everyone Mm -hmm. says is the sound of the ocean, even though it's actually just, like, you know, the blood circulating in your ears and holding a hand over your ear does the same kind of thing. I don't know. I think there's, um, yeah, there's just just interesting stuff to uh, to be had from thinking outside the box a little bit and going beyond functionality into just what is an interesting auditory experience. Let's move on to our last email this time around. Uh, This comes from Dosage, who is a community miner from our uh, Discord. Thank you so much for the email, Dosage. Uh, Hello to my favorite podcasters. I've just been catching up on the podcast, and in the last podcast at the time, 136, you guys mentioned customization in Destiny and World of Warcraft. For all the things in Minecraft and Minecraft Dungeons that you can customize, one thing I would love to hear you chat about is your Minecraft skins. What is your skin? Did you design it? What tools and resources are available? What tools and resources have you both used? Do you ever change your Minecraft skin? And side question, what emotes do you use if you play on Bedrock? Thanks for reading. Stay chunky. Dosage 43. You're the uh, the artist, Joel. How about you start this one? I uh, took a quick uh, route to get mine done. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I have pulled the majority of my skin elements from... Uh, either Nova Skin or another skin uh, download site. I don't really remember the name of it. It's been a very long time because I don't change my skin. I've I made it once back in 2017 and I haven't looked at it since. At least not like looked at changing it. 
Um, I did design my head. I mean, I have the advantage of being a professional artist, um, familiar with pixel art, familiar with Photoshop. So I have a really decent tool to go in and, and experiment with this kind of stuff. I had to learn how the 3D texture wrapped around the player model. But after I got my head around that, um, putting my own glasses, my little newsboy cap, you know, my beard, all that kind of stuff, putting that onto the, onto the player model was actually pretty fun. Uh, and it made the skin that I downloaded feel more personal. You know, like I... I made it look like me, but I didn't like make it look like my clothes. I just, I downloaded a random farmer outfit that had a plaid shirt. Uh, I think I added my own belt just because I looked at it as an artist and said, this needs a little bit something. Uh, I changed the shoes. I, uh, it had short sleeves, but I added like a, a rolled up white cuff to it just to kind of give it a little bit more color and some contrast. I added work gloves to it. So there's stuff like that. I just kind of did on my own. Um, I've not bothered to change it because no one gets to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, you only really get to see my face if you see me on the multiplayer server. Like if I show up in someone else's stream, I'm covered in iron armor. Uh, with the exception of, I guess now you can see my plaid shirt because I wear a light drab most of the time. Yeah. Um, a lot of people actually commented when I started my snapshot playthrough, going like, "Oh gosh, I just realized I've never seen your skin, Joel." Because of, you know, <laughs> when I went to my inventory, they show you in your full skin, and I hadn't had any iron armor because it took me so long to find iron in those first few few streams. So people were like, "I didn't, I had no idea." And the story behind it is that I was doing mostly uh, community farms on uh, the Citadel when I first started playing. I I lived out of a five by seven wood cabin. And it's still there. I haven't really updated it at all. And all of the farms I was building were basically community stuff. So that's why I got the the farmer, you know, kind of outfit. And it's, I mean, the the black and red plaid is pretty Canadian without having a big, you know, maple leaf on my chest. It's also kind of fun in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I liked doing it. I wish there was a way to do more of it. Uh, I've done things like change the texture of my tools in Minecraft because those are things that I see all the time on screen. And I'm much happier when they're a prettier better looking texture um the elytra i absolutely downloaded i have i have had every intention of going in now that i know how to use a block modeler i use one called block bench uh and making myself a better elytra model and then something a little bit more custom and then providing like a a series of those to my server mates so that we can all choose to have our a unique elytra and then have the texture pack kind of be available to other people uh, so that when we do see each other on on the citadel it's a little bit more of a fun experience, but I haven't done it yet. I've just downloaded it. Again, this one I know I got from Nova Skin. And they're just like a cool green techie looking wing. It looks like um, the Vulture from Spider-Man comics. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of what I've got for a, for Elytra. Uh, depending on who, what texture pack people have when I run into them on the server, uh, when I play with Alistair, it's always really funny because I forget until I see myself on his stream. His Elytra texture is the Buzz Lightyear wings from Toy Story. <laughs> that, that's very good. Very fun, right? It's just, it adds this little bit of whimsy, you know, because uh, he's always like running around with like lava buckets or doing something nefarious with mobs. But then when he goes to take off, he takes off <laughs> to infinity and beyond, you know? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that is just kind of fun. Um, I, I wish there was more more ways to make that kind of stuff visible in in game um what's the story behind yours uh i mean i designed mine based on myself i I'd, I'd been playing on xbox for six months before that and all i had access to was the default skin pack which is just a few variations on steve uh alex wasn't even implemented until 1.9 i believe so yeah back when i was playing on xbox i was just steve i didn't see the point in changing it because i was playing single player so all i would see was the arm most of the time anyway but then when I started playing on PC and I, I was playing on PC with the intent of starting a YouTube channel so I knew I had to have some sort of element of appearance that people were going to see more regularly, I designed a skin based on myself. I used uh, needcoolshoes.com, uh, a, a website called Miners Need Cool Shoes, which uh, I still use when I want to look up someone else's skin or on the rare occasion I need to design one. Most recently I ended up designing a skin for my brother-in-law. Um, and there are a few other things out there. Uh, I think the, um, the skin decks is a good place to look if you want some inspiration or you want to just download somebody else's skin to try it out. Uh, it, that is minecraftskins.com, if you can believe it. There are, there are a lot of places like that that you can find it. And if you, if you just Google Minecraft skins or Minecraft skin editor, you'll find any number of places. Um, but yeah, my skin was just based on myself. I just drew it from scratch. Uh, it's relatively easy to do if you have a uh 
you know a, a decent idea in mind and uh in my case it was just clothes that i owned and wore regularly at the time i still wear the jumper a lot um and so yeah it it felt like a a personal connection at that point because i wasn't making videos with a webcam in people didn't necessarily see me so i wanted something that looked like me to give the impression that it was still you know me playing the game um the only other skins i have used have been from the bedrock character creator which i had to use for minecraft earth because you couldn't upload your own skin and then that was global across my other bedrock accounts which you can still import a custom skin into for for local play or online play where it's allowed um the only time i've adapted that skin was when i changed my player head into a jack-o-lantern for a halloween skit on the decidedly vanilla server back in uh 2015 uh i guess um and aside from that i've had the same skin basically since i i started playing um the last part of this question, as far as Bedrock emotes go, I have never used them. Uh, I, I've accidentally hit the emote button once, and it comes up with a wheel full of empty options. Um, and I think you can unlock more of them by getting achievements in Bedrock Edition, so I must have some. But most of my Bedrock activity lately has been single player, so I never really bother to assign emotes. Uh, I've played a couple of multiplayer maps recently, but the need for emotes kind of doesn't really come up when you're in a voice call with somebody recording for a video series. So I've, I've not bothered <laughs> with, with emotes all that much, and it's the kind of thing that I expect would appeal to me if I was a younger player on a multiplayer server without voice chat, but I think for the most part I don't tend to... Uh, I overlook them as a feature in general. Uh, as far as other tools go as well, um, I have access to Photoshop because I'm part of the Creative Cloud subscription. Um, but if you're looking for something to edit, uh, you can use, I mean, any um, art program, if you get the resolution small enough, will become a pixel editor. But some of them can be more specific to that. Uh, Asprite, A-S-E-P-R-I-T-E, -E, uh, is a commercial license for Windows, uh, uh, Mac, and Linux uh, between 0 and 14.99. And then Krita, K-R-I-T-A, is a free open source pixel editor, again, for Windows, Linux, Macs, and actually Android as well. Uh, so if you're looking for something to, to get in there and do some editing and not having to, you know, get it something as nearly as robust as Photoshop, because pixel art in Photoshop is a gross understatement of what that program can do. I'm just faster at it from a work uh, flow perspective, which is why I use it. But, it, but, but you could use just about any pixel art program out there to make a Minecraft skin. Yeah, uh, I, th I think it gets a little bit difficult to deal with if you're not used to looking at unfolded textures <laughs> because the character model is relatively complex compared to, say, a block. And so you find yourself editing this weird kind of flat version of your character and there's some stuff that gets mirrored and some things don't. So it's it's interesting, but it's a, a fairly robust system and I'm glad it exists because it allows people to, to you know, <laughs> look like themselves or look like their favorite video game characters or whatever they want to look like, really. Um, thank you, folks, for all the emails. Uh, that's probably going to be it for this episode of The Spawn Chunks. You can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff we've talked about today at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show was composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud as ever to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, please consider putting some value back in by visiting patreon.com slash thespawnchunks. You can join our community there. Uh, pledging at any level gets you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can listen to the show live as we record it every week, and it gets us closer to our future goals, the next of which is a monthly Minecraft audio hangout with our patrons where we chat about what everyone's been doing in Minecraft that week. Kind of like the quick login we do at the beginning of each episode, but for the community. We're currently at 254 patrons, which is up one from last week. We are reaching the limit of a, uh, an 8-bit integer. I forget where, how that works, but 255 is, like, for some reason, a nerdy number that I remember. Um, special thanks go out to our content engineers, General Pattern 82, Greener Canuck, Hunter 555, Jumbo Sale, and Yitz. Thank you all so much for your support on this episode. Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just poke a friend in the arm from a safe distance, tell them about the Spawn Chunks and where they can go to listen to it. Those locations include iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and even YouTube. Honestly, wherever you can search for podcasts, you can find the Spawn Chunks. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. The RSS feed is linked on thespawnchunks.com. And the patron-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page, and that's where you can listen to the render distance, the extended version of the podcast. 
My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixlriffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixlriffs, where I attempt to make sense of this crazy and wonderful game in a series called The Minecraft Survival Guide. I also stream three days a week on twitch.tv slash Pixlriffs, doing behind-the-scenes work for the Survival Guide series, and I'm the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick search on YouTube. Aside from that, I'm at Pixlriffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? All the things I'm up to online, including my illustration and design portfolio, are at joelduggan.com. You can find my other podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment at thecitadelcafe.com. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I am playing the snapshots on Wednesdays and sometimes even on Fridays before hitting up the Citadel on Saturday and Sunday. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, and Minecraft is almost a teenager. <laughs>